Welcome to the 2018 RMC Nevada Lieutenant Governor's Debate. Today's debate and forum is sponsored by RMC Silver Sponsors, and it's held at the Atlantis Casino and Hotel in Reno, Nevada. Ray Rocher is our host and president of the RMC. Tayton Thomas is our moderator, and Richard Orland is our timer. Just a quick reminder, this debate will be on iTunes and YouTube. You can listen to the replay on your smartphone by searching for the podcast, Timelines of Success, or Meet the Voter. You can also find more information on our website at republicanmensclub.org. Now, without further ado, let's get right into this debate. Welcome to the Lieutenant Governor's Debate sponsored by the RMC, which stands for Republican Men's Club of Northern Nevada. And by the way, we are the largest club in Northern Nevada that's Republican. Tonight's netcast and podcast is made possible by our March Silver Sponsors, who are Brent Jones for Lieutenant Governor, Kim Meyer for Washoe Sheriff, U.S. Nuclear Energy Foundation, Gary Duart, Eugene Hoover for Lieutenant Governor, Tom Hack for U.S. Senate. Our candidates tonight, from my right but their left, or the other way around, are first Eugene Hoover. Thank you. Next, Scott Lafata. Next, Janine Hansen and Brent Jones. Each candidate will have one minute opening statement. We'll start with Eugene, and the first question will st start with Scott. Each candidate will have answers to questions, and they have 30 seconds, each one for a rebuttal. Our moderator tonight is Tayton Thompson. And our timer is Richard Orlin. Let's go ahead and start. Eugene, you're first. Thank you, Ray. I'm Eugene Hoover, and I'm running for Lieutenant Governor for the state of Nevada. The reason I've decided to go on this venture with you is I want to get rid of the commerce tax, and I want politicians in office who are going to do the will of the voters. We have way too many examples of legislators, particularly, not doing what the voters have asked them to do. I'd like to be an example of the opposite of that, and I would, of course, appreciate your support in helping me to achieve that. Also, I've been representing small businesses in the state of Nevada for about seven years as well, trying to get the legislators to understand the importance of low regulation and low taxes in this state. We don't want to be in a situation where we turn out to be like California. There's way too many examples of it. Thank you. Hello, I'm Scott LaFada, and I am also a candidate for lieutenant governor. I'm the most experienced in terms of global business and uh, with the candidates. Uh, my, I pro I'm proposing a Nevada first agenda, and that is I want to see education first, not last. I want to see us diversify our, our businesses and our economy so that our, our uh, wages can grow organically. Thank you for inviting me tonight, and I'm very glad to be here. Thank you, Ms. Lofado. Ms. Hansen? Thank you. My name is Janine Hansen, and I'm the only independent American party candidate here. And I want to thank Ray Rocha for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity. I've been a citizen lobbyist representing taxpayers and families at the Nevada legislature my entire adult life. I raised the money to be there. And I am there representing those who go voiceless at the Nevada legislature. We know that they often fail to represent the people. And one of the reasons is because we aren't involved, we aren't active, we aren't making our voices be heard. And I have been a voice for the voiceless at the legislature 
for many years. I have opposed the taxes that have been passed, the largest tax increase in Nevada history passed by the Republican Party. And I will continue to be an activist in supporting these things, uh, in supporting uh, less government and more individual responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hanson. Lastly, we have candidate Britt Jones. Thank you, and I'm, thank you so much for having me up here. It's wonderful to be up in northern Nevada and kind of sometimes to get out of the big city. It's, it's nice to be up here, although you guys are getting a little bit big yourself. <laughs> but uh, I'm a businessman. Um, I own a number of companies. One of them is Real Water, so I always put a plug in for my Real Water. So if you ever like, give it a try. It's a premium bottle of water. I also own Real Mixed Martial Arts, which is a martial arts um, fighting promotion. And I also started the Real Chamber of Commerce. And I was elected to be a, an assemblyman um, in the 215 cycle or 2015 cycle, and I was so excited, but I saw how we ended up betraying the very people, you, the voters, and going against what we promised to do. All the people ran on a conservative agenda, but we pushed through that largest tax increase. I'd like to say that I was one that voted against it. I also voted against the Faraday uh, tax debacle that, that happened. So I understand what it takes as a businessman what it takes to actually push the button and legislate and, and can withstand the forces of the lobbyists. My three things that I'm very passionate about are the commerce tax, and voter integrity, and the ESAs. We've got to get school choice back in. Thank you, Mr. Jones. All right, we're going to start with our first question that's going to go to Mr. Scott LaFada. Remember, if you have a rebuttal, please wait until everyone is answered. Right. Mr. LaFada. This question comes from Eddie Lorton and J.P. Pueta. How do you stand and how did you stand in the past on the commerce tax? Well, let me tell you, uh, the commerce tax was a surprise to us all here in this state. And it has been a terrible uh, bane against uh, us bringing new business into the state as well as for small business owners, just a real pain in the neck in terms of filling out the forms. Uh, I stood against it then, I stand against it now, and if I'm elected, I will lead the repeal effort. Thank you, Mr. LaFada. All right, Ms. Hanson. Thank you. I was at the legislature and testified repeatedly against the commerce tax. I also alerted the people in the state of Nevada that it was coming, and I think that uh, that is very important, the activism in being involved. One of the things the commerce tax has done is taken us out of a low tax state and put us into a higher bracket state for businesses, which is very harmful for inviting businesses into our state. We have to get back to fundamental reform, and that is to repeal these high taxes. The other problem we have coming on the horizon, and I was glad to hear that the Washoe County Assessor was here because they passed this last session a huge property tax, which will be a constitutional amendment. It will need to be passed this next session. And then after that, it will go on the ballot. But it's an incredible increase in taxes. And I really appreciate the Washoe County Assessor's information that he's put out showing the exorbitant rates in which property taxes for homes and businesses will go up if we don't continue to fight this horrible onslaught of taxes in the state of Nevada. Thank you, Ms. Hanson. Mr. Jones. Well, I can honestly say, and I'm proud to say, I'm the only person running for lieutenant governor that actually voted against the commerce tax. I withstand, withstood the lobbyists and all the pressure. And, and actually, as a result of that commerce tax, one of the things I did is I started the Real Chamber of Commerce because the Metro Chamber came out with a study showing how bad the commerce tax would be for business. Two days later, they repealed it and said it would be good for business. And it was frustrating when the legislature, out of the 42 assemblymen, only seven were bona fide business persons that actually sign the front of the check. So they don't understand the negative impact that additional bureaucracy and, and taxes and stuff takes its toll on business. I originally left California over 15 years ago because it's suppressive to business. We cannot allow our state to slip down that slope, that slippery slope and become like California as well. Um, so that's why I am working with Ron Kinnett personally, as is the real chamber, and we're working aggressively to actually repeal this commerce tax, and we hope to have it on the ballot. So we're out gathering signatures as we speak right now. So I'm not just talking, I'm actually doing and making things happen in this regard. So I'm vehemently opposed to the commerce tax. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. All right, and Eugene Hoover. You know, as a longtime small business owner, the commerce tax coming down the pike was, was truly noticeable. And I had the opportunity to testify against the commerce tax as well. I wish we had been more effective. I wish we had been able to prevent it from being passed. As I mentioned earlier, none of us want to turn into California 
And I think the other thing that's really important to understand about the commerce tax is this commerce tax is not necessarily about the tax that they've just collected. This is, shall we say, the, the camel's nose inside the tent. This will allow them in the future to raise the taxes on all of us here in Nevada much easier. And I would encourage everybody here to sign the repeal and let's work together to try to get this thing thrown out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hoover. Do we have any rebuttals? Yes, I'd like to uh, say a couple things, and that is each industry in the commerce tax is taxed differently. So there's challenges in there in terms of the way the legislator, le legislature went about it to tax, let's say, dry cleaners more than other types of businesses. So from the very start, it was a bad law. Let's repeal it. Let's get it off the books. Mr. Hoover. Yeah, I, I agree with what what Scott's saying here. You know, the state of Nevada now has access to all the volume for all the different industries in the state. And frankly, if, if they turn out that, you know, plumbers, as an example, do a billion dollars with a business in the state, it's going to be very easy for them just to raise enough tax to pay for their next pet project. Thank you. Mr. Jones. Just one quick thing to echo some of these remarks is this commerce tax is actually a lobbyist dream because what they can do is they can then pit different industries against each other and extract money from uh, the various industries to say, no, keep mine low, but, but build this other one up. And what's unfortunate about it too, it's like our own mini IRS now. So now we have an IRS basically in the state of Nevada, which we didn't prior. Ms. Hanson? One of the problems with repealing the tax that we will run into, and that is the tremendous force of government bureaucracy and the teachers union that will oppose it. What we have to do is change the way we do business in Nevada in order to be able to reduce the money we're spending on government so that we can actually implement a tax reform and a tax repeal. We need to institute choice in education in Nevada like they've done in places like Washington, D.C. and in uh, Florida in order to be able to reduce the high cost of education so that we can reduce the taxes that we're paying. Thank you very much, Ms. Hanson. All right, question two, we're going to start with Ms. Hanson. Ms. Hanson, this question comes from Biggs, Ben Zunino. Please describe your top three core values and how you apply them in your decision-making process. Thank you. The first thing I want to do as my core value is support our constitutional rights. Right now, we have very many constitutional rights in jeopardy. Our right to keep and bear arms, our right to freedom of religion, our right to freedom of speech are all in jeopardy uh, by the left, and these are very important. Also, our right to property. That's one of the most important things I want to do. The second one is moral integrity. We have to stand with moral integrity if we are going to lead. We ourselves must tell the truth and expect others to tell the truth and require that. The third thing is accountability. We must have accountability and transparency in government. We must expect them to tell the truth and we must expect to, to scrutinize exactly what they're doing. One of the problems we have now is when businessmen are, uh, go into court, into an administrative court, all their constitutional rights are uh, eliminated. And so we must restore the right to trial by jury and the right, other rights that have been lost uh, by our businessmen in order to hold the bureaucracy in check. Thank you. Mr. Jones, what are your three core values and how do you use them in your decision-making process? Um, I'm going to sound a little bit like an echo chamber here, but first is, is integrity. So many Republicans run as conservatives, and as we witnessed in the 2015 election cycle, they all ran as conservatives, and yet we still passed the largest tax increase in our state's history. And that's one of the things that I like to put out, put or promote, is until you actually have to push the button, you don't really know what it's like, because when you're in there up at, up at Carson, you have so much pressure going on you all the time from the lobbyists, from the governor, from whoever. And, and if you can stand by what you say and stand up with integrity, that's very important. And so many of our candidates don't do that. Second thing is, we've got to keep our country a limited uh, government country. We became the greatest country on planet Earth in a little over 200 years because we had limited government. It's just beyond me why we think we have to just keep increasing taxes, increasing taxes, and growing government. Even fellow Republicans, we need to add another sales tax. We need to add this tax, a cop tax. Why? We do not need to do that. And third is family. I really, I love my family and I appreciate my family and, and, I, and I want to help them and, and encourage them. And that's one of the reasons I'm running is because I do not want my children to inherit a mess. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. 
Mr. Hoover, please describe your top three core values and how you apply them in your decision-making process. Well, I have to echo what everybody else is saying up here as well. Integrity comes right to the top of the list. Without that, it's really hard to work with people. The second is, of course, the guiding shining light, if you will, it's the Constitution. The Constitution has to be part of the core value in how you move forward as a politician. And three, an open door policy for all and willing to negotiate and talk with everyone to work out the best avenue for the citizens of Nevada. Thank you. Mr. LaFada, please describe your top three core values and how you apply them in your decision making process. Well, firstly, We've got to trust the U.S. Constitution, and we've got to support the Founding Fathers' guidance in God we trust. I think that's so important, and we don't see that much anymore. Family and community are, are close to me, and, and any decisions I make or anything I'm doing has got to have family and community in mind. Uh, thirdly, I'm endorsed by the Gwynn family, and Governor Gwynn always had this concept of, I'm for the people, not just for the party, because we're really ruling for all Nevadans and helping all Nevadans out. So those are my three core principles. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any rebuttals? Right, seeing none. Question three comes from Mr. Ray Rocha. So if elected lieutenant governor, how would you promote tourism within the state of Nevada? We'll start with you, Mr. Jones. Okay, well, first of all, that's an easy one for me because as a businessman, I get it. I know what it takes to run a business. But more importantly, if we keep our state a pro-business state, it's easy to do the job. People are flooding, are leaving California right now for this very reason that they're, they're being persecuted as business owners. So if we can continue to keep our state a pro-business state, and what I mean by that is not just doing crony capitalist deals like, like a, the Faraday deal where they get tens of millions of dollars in tax credits for a concept that doesn't even exist. You know, GoEd actually brought in a water company, and my company was uh, paying taxes in, in, in our state for 10 years, and GoEd brings in another company, gives them a bunch of incentives to come and compete against me when I've been paying taxes. That's not what works. What works is keeping an overall balance of pro-business, and they will come. It's kind of like build it and they will come. If you build a, a pro-business environment, they will come. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Mr. Hoover, if elected Lieutenant Governor, how would you promote tourism within the state of Nevada? Well, the first thing I'd want to do is do everything I can to kill the commerce tax. If we can have a more competitive environment here, it's going to be easier for our businesses, easier for our citizens of Nevada. So that would be number one. Number two is I've had an opportunity to go to almost every single community in the state, and I think that we need to do more to promote the tourism around the state and perhaps less on an international basis. And I think that would be very helpful. We have some wonderful treasures in this state, and I think we ought to let some more people know about it so we can draw more people in. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. LaFada, if elected lieutenant governor, how would you promote tourism within the state of Nevada? Well, first of all, I think we need to provide a very safe environment for the folks that come here. There's been a lot of concern recently, and I think we need to make sure that folks are comfortable and they can have a great time and come back. And I think we need to promote customer service in our state. I think we've slipped uh, over the last several years, and we've got a lot of competition out there throughout the United States and around the world. Once again, we're in a global economy. We need to look at these as global solutions, and so we need to go bring folks from other countries here to enjoy Nevada, the Nevada that we know and love. Thank you. And we'll end it with you, Ms. Hanson. If elected Lieutenant Governor, how would you promote tourism within the state of Nevada? Well, we have a wonderful state to promote, and I live in Elko, and one of the things we can see are the wonderful natural resources we have, but one of the problems we have is the federal government has locked up many of those resources, and we need to uh, return the state of Nevada into the hands of the state rather than the federal government. For instance, in Elko County, many of our roads that have been open for over 100 years are now being closed. They're being closed to anybody that wants to walk or drive or use those roads to get into our rural communities. And so this is one of the things we need to face if we really want to bring people from around the world to come to Nevada. We have to take back control of our own lands. The other thing is we have to get back to fundamentals. We're not going to bring people here by continuing to raise all the taxes. And once we stop that tax increase and uh, continually going forward and be aware that there are taxes right now they're planning to raise, then we can honestly say to people, come to our state, because we have a state that welcomes you as a tourist and as a businessman. And we have to go back to fundamentals. Thank you, Ms. Hanson. All right. Any 
Yeah. Okay, Mr. Jones. You. Yes, thank you, thank you. One of the things I want to add, and we keep talking about this, we're kind of beating the same drum because we're all very similar in, in thoughts, but one of the things to think about is that um, we keep on raising taxes on the rooms. And you know, Las Vegas, and, and particularly Reno, the biggest little city, it used to be you could always come here and get a real good deal and, and feel that you're part, you know, you're kind of part of the community. Now you got to pay for parking down south. You got when you you book your room, you got one fee, but then you got to pay all this extra stuff. If we keep doing that, so there's going to be a tipping point where it's going to, at some point, start turning off the people from coming. So we really got to put a handle on that. We don't need to keep raising taxes. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Do you have any other rebuttals? All right. Question four is from Roger Edwards. How do you feel you can help the new Republican governor if elected? Start with you, Mr. Hoover. Well, obviously, the lieutenant governor and the governor need to work very closely together. It's in the best interest of the citizens. And I think that the governor and the lieutenant governor would strive for that relationship. And I think the lieutenant governor historically has been very pro-business. And of course, I've had a long history in, in business, and I'd like to be able to use that to apply that. So I believe that a strong relationship between the governor and the lieutenant governor will be paramount for both positions. Thank you. Mr. LaFalda, how do you feel you can help the new Republican governor? Well, let's first say that uh, we can't count the governor's race as in the bag just yet. We've got some heavy-duty competition, and we might have a mixed, mixed ticket. And if I'm elected and we do have a Democratic governor, I'll have to work with that person to make sure that we uh, protect our Republican values. Of course, we've got some very fr uh, strong front runners as Republicans, and I will work. I've got a good relationship with each of them, and I'll work very closely with them to ensure that we work on not only their agenda, but work in the Nevada First agenda in with it. Thank you, Mr. LaFauna. Ms. Hanson. Thank you. I think we've seen some real good things from the, from the governor candidate of Adam Laxalt. Very pleased with his support of the Second Amendment. Very pleased with his opposition to Obamacare and what he has done and stood up. That, what he, that is what he has been, an advocate for the people in the state of Nevada. And as the lieutenant governor, I would be an advocate and a voice for those who have been voiceless, the voice for the people whose um, issues are continually ignored. And I work with everyone at the legislature. I work with the Democrats when I agree with them. I work with the Republicans when I agree with them. And I work with whoever we, uh, I need to in order to get the job done so that we can do the best things for families. I think one of the greatest issues we have in our state is that families are suffering, not only because of taxes, but we haven't focused on what are the best policies for families in our state. And I feel that as an advocate for families my entire adult life, and a grandma of 14, uh, which makes me very interested in their future, I think I could be an advocate and work with whoever happens to be the governor. Thank you, Ms. Hanson. Mr. Jones? Of course, this is a mixed bag. If, if we get a Democratic governor, which unfortunate, could be unfortunate uh, reality, uh, there, there's different than if we work with uh, Mr. Laxalt, if he's the nominee or the, gets elected. Um, of course, Adam, or Mr. Laxalt, is very very good constitutionally. He's done a good job as our AG. But the main thing with the with Lieutenant Governor is, is you know, you don't really have a lot, lot of political clout, so to say, but you're the salesman for the state. So you sell the state on what a great state it is. And that's your main job. So as a business owner, I sell all day long. Everything I do is sales. So I think I could, I could really sell uh, the state. And I believe I love this state. And I've done well. So I'll be able to sell the state. Any rebuttals? Right. Question number five comes from Mr. Jim Hogan. How should we protect our children from gun violence while they're at school? Mr. Alfada? Well, first of all, I come from a law enforcement family uh, with a military background. And I do believe that uh, we need to do, I know the governor has recently released uh, uh, some monies to go ahead and work with each of the school districts to identify and make sure that our schools are secure. That's the first thing. The second thing is we need to provide armed guards at each location so that in case something does happen, we've got people on the spot. And then the third thing is I think that uh, today we even have the ability for the superintendent or the principal of the school can allow certain teachers permission to uh, carry concealed in the classrooms, and I, I'm a proponent of that. So I, I, I think that what we need to do is, you know, overall, Take a look at security, make sure we're ready, and, and just leave, you know, a lot of cases, the doors are left open, and we can't do that anymore. Thank you. 
Ms. Hanson, how do you feel we should protect our children from gun violence while they're at school? You know, criminals prefer unarmed victims, and one of the most important things we have to change is the fact that uh, cowards who want to harm children see a sign over all of our schools which says gun-free zone. And we have to end that. We don't want our schools to be gun-free zones. I worked since 1995 during the legislature to ensure that law-abiding citizens can carry concealed weapons. We need to have people trained in our schools in order to protect our children. And there are several different ways to do that. We could have armed guards, but we could also have people that are trained, like teachers or principals or others who feel that they are adequately trained to, pr to protect our children. Uh, and once they know that the schools are protected, they won't be soft targets anymore, and that's very important. Uh, we also have to be careful to have the school police there. My granddaughter recently in Washoe County at a school function after a dance, there were no police there, and 20 children surrounded her car with her mother and were beating on the car, and they barely escaped. Someone came and intervened a father so that they could get away. We need to continue to promote respect in our schools among our children. And it's hard to do when we've taken God out of the schools. Thank you, Ms. Hanson. Mr. Jones. How should we protect our children from gun violence while they're at school? Obviously the solution is in our Constitution or our Bill of Rights is the Second Amendment. One of the things when I was in the legislature that I really was excited about and really enjoyed was Mr. Lott, who was a, he was a liberal professor, he did studies on guns, and he, he does lots of studies, and he found out that the more people, good honest people that have guns, the less gun violence there is. If you look across the state, Chicago, New York, LA, where all they have the high gun gun laws, to restrictions, that's where they have the worst problem. So yes, we need to have campus carry would be great. We almost got campus carry through. If, uh, you know, Megan was at UNR a couple years ago, she got unfortunately raped, but if she would have had her own gun, she could have prevented that. And then of course we could have marshals in the school similar to the flights as, and then trained concealed weapons um, teachers, I think it would be, be the awesome way. But, you know, our founding fathers, they understood the problems that could occur here, and that's why it is the Second Amendment, and that's why they said shall not be infringed. And when honest, good people have guns, then they're not victims. Our society is being created a bunch of victims. We do not need more victims. Thank you. Mr. Hoover, how should we protect our children from gun violence while they're at school? I'm simply going to echo what everybody else said. It's simple. It's not much to this. Get rid of the gun-free zones. Have good guys in the schools with guns. How simple does it get? But that's it right there. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Hoover. Do we have any rebuttals? I'd just like to quickly say, it, you know, I think we all know it's going to take a good guy with a gun to stop a bad guy with a gun. So I think we're all in tune with that. All right. Question number six comes from Tom Hughes. If elected Lieutenant Governor, how would you help to support the enforcement of federal immigration law? Ms. Hanson? Thank you for that question. I've worked many years at the legislature to stop Nevada from becoming a sanctuary state, and that is what hap has happened. This last year, they had a bill to uh, extend driver authorization cards uh, for illegal aliens from a renewal of one year to four years just like uh, American citizens. In Utah, they require them, before they can get a driver's authorization card, to prove that they're here legally, to have a tax, uh, tax ID number with the IRS, and also to sign that they will be responsible for any uh, financial damages, like for insurance. I think it's very important we begin to roll back the welcome mat to illegal aliens. Uh, every year, it costs Nevada taxpayers $630 million to pay for the welfare benefits of illegals. Every family is being pay paying out about $763 million for uh, help for illegal aliens. We need to take back our state. Everybody needs to pay their own way, and we don't need this burden any further. I'm against Nevada as a sanctuary state. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jones. How would you help to support the federal or enforce the federal immigration law? Well, one of the terms that we need to all just look at is called illegal aliens. It means some, doing something illegal. When we, when we um, justify or encourage illegal activity, what do you get? You get more illegal activity. One of our opponents who's not here today, um, or Lieutenant Governor, he actually signed SB 303 or actually sponsored it, which was to give the driver's license to illegals. So what does that do? That legitimizes illegal conduct. And once they have a driver's license, what do they do? They register to vote. So again, it, it, it 
legitimizes illegal conduct. We cannot legitimize illegal conduct. We need to discourage illegal conduct. But we also need to encourage people to follow the legal system as it's written, because we are a nation of immigrants. But yes, become an immigrant, but follow the, the legal path. And that's what we need to do. Sanctuary cities, it's just atrocious what's happening in many cities. And, and we've got to stop that in our state as well. Um, again, it all gets back to if you legitimize and reward people to do improper conduct, they do more improper conduct. We've got to remove the incentives so that we incentivize people to do proper conduct. And that's follow the rule of law. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Mr. Hoover, if elected Lieutenant Governor, how would you help to support the enforcement of federal immigration law? Well, I think to start with, we'd work at the legislature. And I think that we would do everything we can to get basically an environment in the state legislature that basically condones legal immigration, not illegal immigration. And wherever that falls, that's where we need to be. Second of all, obviously we have some bills in place right now that should be removed and we need to work on doing that as well. And that's where it needs to start is at the state legislature process. I don't think anybody here or most people here think that illegal immigration is a good thing. It's legal immigration we're looking for. We're, we're a very welcoming country, but it needs to be legal. Thank you. Mr. LaFada, if elected Lieutenant Governor, how would you help to support the enforcement of federal immigration law? Well, first of all, First of all, I think we need to support President Trump and his agenda. I support him 100% in his activities and how he's going about it. I also am a proponent for a constitutional amendment to ban sanctuary cities in Nevada. Thank you. Do we have any rebuttals? Mr. Jones? Yes, I would also like to add that I'm very encouraged by what our now President Trump's doing. And I want to point out that I was one of the first, if not the first, uh, elected official to come out in support of um, Mr. Trump before it was popular. And I was very privileged to meet him a number of times and actually get to introduce him at the South Point in front of about three to 5,000 people. So if we support our president, he's really working in this direction. And I appreciate that. And we need to continue to help him and his efforts. Thank you. Ms. Hanson? I think there's one other issue along this line of illegal immigration we need to be aware of. There was a, a constitutional amendment passed this last session of the legislature which would create a constitutional right for emergency medical care. Uh, and what this will do, it will destroy our medical care in the state of Nevada. In California, what's happened under the federal laws, they've had 84 hospitals close. And so we will lose our own medical care. One of the reasons for this is because of the high cost of medical care for illegal immigrants. And we need to support the president's efforts to stop this. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Due to everything going so smoothly, we've got time for one more question. So a seventh question, we'll start with Mr. Jones. This is from Ms. Grace Hale Fontenot. Northern Nevada largely has felt unfair and there's a rivalry between it and the South. How will you work to, be, to provide better representation in the state constitutional offices to the North? Um, I don't know if we so much a rivalry in that it, the, uh, Clark County has such a big voting block, okay? But if you're a true Republican, a conservative Republican, not a crony capitalist Republican or rhino Republican, you appreciate the North. I mean, you guys are all conservative up here. It's, it's, <laughs> okay, well, many more of you are conservative up here than you are in Clark County. Let me put it that way. Um, I'm actually encouraged when I go up here because the people that we meet and or that I meet and, and the voting policies, I mean, when you have people like Ira and Don Gustafson and the others, they're, they're a brush of, breath of fresh air when you compare them to Roberson's and, and Paul Anderson's, trust me. So I think it, it comes down to true conservatives. I don't think there's a rivalry. Rhinos that want to violate what they do and just do crony deals, absolutely. So the way to do that is to get the crony capitalism and the cro uh, dirty politics out of our state. Thank you. Mr. Hoover, how would you provide better representation in the state constitutional offices to the north? Well, I guess the first thing I would mention is that I'm from the north, and that would be helpful as well. <laughs> um, the other, the other thing I, I would mention is, you know, we're coming up to a situation where we're going we're gonna to have redistricting, redistricting coming up. And it is going to be important that we get more Republicans in the state legislature so that we're in command of that and the Democrats are not. That will be better, very beneficial. You know, we've got so much population down in, in Clark County. Uh, it's it's going to be very hard due to the population growth down there for us to be in control of a lot of things. I think what we need to do is support our people from the north so that they can have an influence up here for us. 
Thank you. Mr. LaFada, how would you provide better representation in the state constitutional offices in the North? Well, first of all, the role of the Lieutenant Governor is not only the President of the Senate, but also in charge of business development. So when I started to run, I asked for a copy of our detailed business development plan for the state in terms of where, what, how, when, how much money, uh, the economic impact, the, uh, you know, the, the infrastructure impact. We don't have one, folks. So how I would support the North is we need, to, we need to have a committee and some things, and we need to agree where we want to take this state economically as we diversify the economy. What does the North want to look like in the future? What does the South want to look like in the future? We don't have a plan. We've relied heavily on mining. We've re we relied heavily on, uh, on gaming. And it's time we look at aerospace defense. It's time we look at automobile manufacturing, all these other things. But they have a huge impact in the state in terms of its people and, and, uh, and where we're going. So once again, I put together a, a, an economic plan that we could all draw from. Thank you, Mr. LaFada. And Ms. Hansen, how would you provide better representation of our constitutional offices in the North? Thank you. I was born and raised in Sparks and lived here until about 12 and a half years ago, and then I moved to Elko. I have spent a lot of time in every county. I spent a lot of time going and getting signatures, for instance, in 2004 to ax the tax. I went to every single county and organized there in order to do it. So I'm familiar with every one of the small counties and have spent a lot of time there. One of the things we find is that a county like uh, Lincoln County has 1% private land. They can't even afford to pay uh, for their schools because the federal government controls the rest of the land. One of the ways to improve uh, the situation in the north is to return the lands to the state of Nevada so that they can have economic development in the rural counties and that will create a lot more conservatives uh, who will be able to um, and, and developing the, those business plans so I think that's one of the priorities for me thank you thank you Miss Hanson do we have any rebuttals all right seeing none all right we're gonna go forward with our closing statements just a reminder you have two minutes um, for time after, you, of course, can mingle with everyone here, but two minutes for each person, starting with Mr. Hoover. I think the first I'd like to start with by thanking everybody for being here. I appreciate everybody being involved, because this is what it takes to get Republicans elected, is to get out here, to be involved. And by the way, we're going to need a lot of people to help walk, make phone calls, and the like. So you guys are the ones that make this happen in Washoe County. I appreciate all the support you've given me in the past. I ask you to step up again this time as well. And let's get another small business owner from the north into the lieutenant governor's office. Thank you. Mr. LaFada. First of all, I'd like every one of you to go to scottlafada.com and take a look at my website and take a look at the Nevada First Agenda. See if you agree with it. Let's join together and come up with a detailed economic plan for the state and work together to make, solve all these issues. We've got a very divided state. We need to work together with the left and the right to come together to solve these problems. And I'm the man to stand up there and make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hanson. Thank you. I'm a native Nevada, and I love this state. I'm concerned about the future of your children and your grandchildren and mine. I have dedicated my life to trying to have a better state. I have organized a nonprofit organization and have raised the money to keep it going my entire adult life so that we could have an impact at the state legislature. I think it's very important to be involved and to be active in order to do these things. And I think that uh, I'm unafraid. I'm unafraid to speak my mind and to carry those constitutional principles forward. I've appreciated being with these uh, nice gentlemen here tonight. They had a lot of good things to say. And there will be four Republicans in the primary. But if you don't get the one you want, I'll be on the November election ballot. So you won't have to vote for somebody that voted for the commerce tax and, <laughs> and got it through there. So you have a real option. And I want to appreciate, too, the fact I, I questioned Ray about inviting me here. I said, are you sure you want an independent American to come? And he said, yes. And I want to tell him how much I appreciate that. Because when I am at the legislature, I work with the Republicans all the time. And they work with me. And I appreciate them so much. And all, I have many friends that are. And I appreciate your activism. Because without people like you making a difference in your communities, speaking up, voting, getting other people out to vote for the best candidates, 
None of our work will make any difference. You have to make a difference wherever you are, and you can. You're here tonight, and that shows me that you care about the future of your state and your community. And that is a wonderful to know that there are so many people that care, and I appreciate each one of you for being here tonight and the opportunity to come. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hanson. All right, Mr. Jones closes out. Well, I'd like to, first of all, again, thank you like everyone else has done. I appreciate this. And it was very beautiful flying in um, on Southwest Airline, looking at your mountains and stuff around with the snow cap. And I will acknowledge that Janine is always at the legislature, and she does work very hard. So I do want to acknowledge you. That, that is absolute truth. And you were a wonderful assemblyman. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> That's what I want to point out uh, in this closing. We're all good guys here. The other one that didn't show up today, I'm not going to say so much about. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> We're all good guys, but it gets down to this. When, when you're running for office, it's easy to say you stand for all these things. What matters is when you actually have to push the button, when you have all the pressures and forces of all the different people, whether it be the governor, or the lobbyists, you're, 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 uh, the guys that donated money, and they're saying, you better vote this way or not. And we've seen time and time again that, that our Republicans don't vote the way that they represented they would. I have pushed that button, and I'm happy to say that I did get a very, very good rating by NPRI, which is the Nevada Policy Research Institute, and they showed that I, I was the one that was willing to press the button in the right way in, in light of all the pressures that had gone on. So not to say anything negative, but until you push that button, you don't really know how people are going to react. And that's very, very important. I want you to think about that. Um, also, I do go out of my way. It's so, I, when, I was, when I'm going around getting money right now to, for this campaign, I drive by business after business, and I look at it and I say, you know what's so frustrating? All these businessmen, all they're doing is caring about only just their business, and they don't really get into the mix of trying to help keep our state a pro-business state, keep a limited government state. And it's frustrating to me because that would be the easy thing to do. I have a number of successful businesses. I could just only focus on that. But I found I have a passion to want to help. That's why I, was, I wasn't elected last time, but I was testifying against the, the wage being hiked to 15 bucks. I was testifying against every uh, business had to have a room 10 by 12 or they'd get a $5,000 fine. I started the Real Chamber of Commerce to get pro-business ideas out there. So even though it'd be easier for me just to run my business, I have such a passion for this state to keep it pro-business. I have pressed the button. I will stand strong. I do have integrity. And that, I believe, is what's very important because the pressures will come, particularly if we get a Democrat as a governor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Jones. All right. Thank you all very much. I'm going to turn it back over to Mr. Ray Rocha. Thank you. You guys did a great job. Thank you for coming up here, especially some that had the visit. I'm just going to take a few minutes before we do the 50-50. this is bill and thank you for watching go ahead and if you're not signed in sign into your gmail go right up here and subscribe to rmc tv and go over here watch a couple more videos link to our website at republicanmenstclub.org and finally make sure you go down and leave a comment the comments really help see you on the next video